I'ma let you in on this seat. You just can't let me go. Cause it's gone.
preaching from the text you gave me that is a difficult passage to share. Not that it's difficult to understand. It's when you understand what it says that makes it difficult to say. For it will be a reality for an overwhelming majority of people. Not that the course could not be changed. Not that they cannot hear even right now and be saved. This world has grabbed so many. Makes so many feel like we can just keep going on and on. Everything's been going on the same forever. I don't have to be committed. I don't have to submit. Lord, right now, I ask you. I ask you to anoint me in your presence. Saturate me in your spirit. I decrease that you may increase. Speak to your people through your passage on this day. Lord, I'll be careful in the name of Jesus. Praise you, God, Lord. Father, I, I need you right now. It is in your name that I believe the help is already on the way. It is in your name I believe the anointing is already there. It is in your name I believe you will be a mirror to each one who will listen and need your word today. It is in your mighty and everlasting name that I pray and give thanks and ask that you forgive me of anything. I may have said thoughts done on even look at and encourage you your word. Amen. 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 Ushers, you may be seated. I remember taking my daughters, both of them, to a couple of birthday parties when they were in grade school. And the parents of the child, they lived in a private gated community. Now, when you attempt to go to the home of someone who lives in a private gay community. You will need an access code in order to gain entry. Or when you arrive at the gate, you're going to have to speak to the guard at the gate. Now the guard will call the person who lives in that private gay community. And even though you may tell the God that you know the people who are living there, but if the person who lives there in that private gated community, if they say they don't know you, you will not be allowed to go through the gate. Now, if you view this illustration as it relates to heaven, we can say all day long here on earth that we know Jesus. But getting into heaven requires Jesus knowing you. As a pastor, the question that I ponder most, especially in what I truly believe we are living in, the literal end of the end time. Question that I ponder most is are all the members and the visitors of the church God has blessed me to pastor the McKinney First Baptist Church? Is everybody saved? We can pray that people get that are sick be healed, and that's a good prayer. We can pray those who don't have a job be employed, and that's a good prayer. We can pray for those who have wayward children and the children would come back as a good prayer. But all of those things without Jesus simply means temporary, uh, 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 temporary pleasure or temporary uh, blessing granted on earth with something more eternal that is lacking. That which compels me to lead and to participate in shop every Tuesday.
When I say shout, I'm talking about sweet hour of prayer every Tuesday night from 7 to 8. That which compels me to teach Wednesday Bible study at noonday and at 7. That which compels me to teach the new members class. That which compels me to witness in my sphere of influence. And share the gospel from this pulpit. There's a deep concern everyone in TMFBC's sphere of influence. Come to know Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. And then for each one who is saved to go out and make disciples. Go out and cast the net of the gospel. Church, every human being is going to spend eternity either in heaven or in hell. There is no other option. Eternity is forever and ever. We have just a little while here on this earth. Our lives are but a vapor. We're going to be here just for a little while. So if we are going to spend eternity in one or two places, it should be the most important thing to us of being assured that we know beyond shadow of doubt where we're going to spend eternity. So the text of the Holy Spirit as my God, I'd like to share with you briefly three object lessons. Regarding the contemplative and interrogatory subject, I know who Jesus is, but does Jesus know me? Object lesson number one. Entering the kingdom of heaven requires more than mere words. Now, depending on your current standing with God, our text could be one of the most alarming texts in the Bible. Today's message, when you shut the corner all the way down to the car, reveals that human life boils down to two gates. A wide gate and a narrow gate. It, it, it entails two roads. The broad way and the difficult way. And your choice of which gate and which road you travel will eventually lead you to two destinations. You will live eternally in hell or you will have eternal life in death. Let's walk through the text. Verse 21, the eight calls tells us, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Mm. There are people who know and utilize eternal language, but they are not a part and not on the pathway to eternal life. I mean, you can project the church look. You can have the church image. I mean, a big Bible in your hand, cross around your neck, this sign on your car. You can know all of the key church phrases. I know we got some church lingo. You, you, you say, I'm too blessed to be stressed. Help me out with this. God is good. And all the time. Boy, that sounds good. You can even know a lot of Bible verses. But the real question is, what is your standing with the God of the Bible? A sermon text is a part of Jesus' clothes. In the most famous sermon Jesus ever preached called the Sermon on the Mount. It begins in Matthew chapter 5 verse 3 and it goes through Matthew chapter 7 verse 29. So when Jesus says in verse 21, when he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, Jesus affirms that a proper verbal confession is needed, but a verbal confession in and of itself is not enough. Right. Yes, we must use the language of Lord, Lord. We cannot be saved without it. Our children 
children sang not too long ago, and they sang from the scriptures because Romans 10 and 9 says, if we confess with our mouth who the Lord Jesus, believe in our heart, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. The warning that Jesus is making in this text, it applies to people who speak or say things to Jesus or about Jesus, but really don't mean it. They quote information, but that information that they quote has not resulted in a transformed life. It isn't that they believe Jesus is the devil. They simply say the words very superficially. Their mind and heart is elsewhere, but yet they believe that there is some eternal value in mere words. Church, Jesus is not looking for fans, but rather Jesus wants disciples, those who are learners of the master, who then go do what the master says do. Verse 21a is also a warning against self-deception. You know it's one thing to be deceived by somebody else, but it's a far greater tragedy to be deceived by yourself. You are self-deceived if you are, if you say that you are saved, but your lifestyle has not radically changed. If I told you yesterday I got hit by a Mack truck that was driving 70 miles an hour, but I'm all right. I don't think you believe me. If I was hit by a Mack truck driving 10 miles an hour, it would probably radically change me. So in other words, what I say don't line up with who I am. In this text, information is important to know. But if it doesn't lead to transformation, it's just information. And the devil got a whole lot of information. <clears throat> Here we see that self being self-deceived is also reflection that our lifestyle not only has not radically changed, but you're deceiving yourself if you are a practicing, unrepentant sinner. That's really what he's referring to there. And, and you can see what is practicing unrepentant sinner. What does that look like? First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 10 is one of the best examples in all the Bible. And it, and it says this about self-deception. It says this about people who will not go to heaven. It says, do you not know that the righteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Here's that phrase, do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners, none will receive, none will rather inherit the kingdom of God. Now, does that mean anybody who's ever done any of those sins, does that automatically mean that they're going to hell? No, it doesn't. When it talks about how Paul is speaking of this, he's talking about people who are doing these things as a lifestyle. Because here is something, the one thing everybody in here can say amen on right quick. Saved people sin daily just like unsaved people. Yeah, yeah, that's a good place to say amen right now. Now the difference, however, is saved people have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us so that when we sin we are convicted of the sin we then confess the sin, we call sin what the Bible calls sin and we ask Jesus to give us strength to overcome the sin or addiction a saved person can have a struggle with the sin but struggling means we're striving to live holy, struggling means I'm still going in this direction. I'm still surprised. If you're trying to go up a tree or up a mountain, you may grab a twig that hit strong in your arm slip. And then you go down a step or two. But if you try to go on up, you grab and you go on up and you keep going. 
entering the kingdom of heaven requires obedience to Jesus' teaching. Look at the last part of verse 21. First it said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Here's our verse. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now let me be crystal clear here. Jesus is not saying nor alluding to salvation is accomplished by works. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 through 9 tells us how we are saved and it tells us how we are not saved. The text says, for oh, by grace you've been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it, talking about salvation, is the gift of God, not of works. At least anyone should boast. Before you were saved, you served the pseudo God of this world. That's the devil. You lived according to the dictates of your own heart. You did what you wanted to do regardless of what the Bible says. But when you got saved, you came under the authority of Jesus and his word. You realized you were bought with a price. What was that price? The shed atoning blood of Jesus on the cross called Calvary, where he went and died for every sin, past, present, and future. Therefore, you don't belong to self anymore. If you are saved, you have residing inside of you the Holy Spirit who will lead you to adhere to Ephesians 2 10, which says what we are is workmanship. We've been created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Notice it said for good works, not by good works. Once you say you do good works, you can't do good works to get saved. In verse 21, Jesus, after the crowds, started gathering around him. You know, one of the things that I find most, one of the most interesting things I love to read, when I'm just reading for, for, for both knowledge and just, just, just in meditation, go read what Jesus oftentimes said when a whole lot of people start following him. It's very unlike how we do it in the church. When, when, when a whole lot of people start following Jesus, Jesus would say something like this, Madison. He'd say, birds have nests. Uh, foxes have holes. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay down his head. In other words, he wasn't promising everybody you're going to be healthy, wealthy, and prosperous when you follow him. Listen, 
what the psalmist said in the 84th Psalm, verse 11. It says, no good thing will he withhold from those who walk righteously. You will not go to heaven, church, living out the Burger King thing. You know the Burger King thing happens your way. You, you, you're not going to follow Frank Sinatra so I did it my way and make it in heaven because my way is got to be God's way. And God's way for us will be a difficult way. Not an impossible way. Not a way that you can't make it through. It will be difficult in our street. But when we cry out to the master and say, Lord, I need you. Lord, help me. Lord, help me bear. Then the Lord comes and says, that's what I've been waiting for you to do in the first place. When Jesus says in verse 21b, he who does the will of my father, the will of God refers to the character and the conduct of the kingdom of God based on being obedient to the word of God. Matter of fact, I love the way John, the apostle John, he spills it out. He lets us know if you're in here right now and say, what is the will of God? I'm so glad I saw a question mark. Come over two or three years. Let me read it to you. In, in the gospel according to John chapter 6, Verse 39 and 40, it says this. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. That's what the will of God was referring to. Church, you cannot get around reading, studying, meditating on, praying back the word of God in faith and being obedient to the word of God. The Bible must become our final authority. We can't keep on letting Congress and, and, and the Supreme Court and, and, and the world in general and TV tell us how we're supposed to live. Because there's a lot of lifestyles and a lot of actions that they approve of that God doesn't approve of. Matter of fact, God called much of that sin, and if God called it sin, we who are saved got to call it the same thing. Finally, I'll be But what I got to say is the ultra important. Object lesson number three is entering the kingdom of heaven requires more than human works. It requires more than mere words. It requires being obedient. And it requires more than human works. It's right here in verse 22. Look at this. Close. Many will say to me in that day. Look close at what they say. Lord, Lord. Have we not prophesied in your name? Cast our demons in your name? Done many wonders in your name? Hmm. Now remember earlier that we've already established, based on Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, that we do good works because we are saved, not to get saved. We do good works because it's a reflection of our gratitude to God for grace. By grace through faith. And by saying in that day, Jesus is drawing our attention to the fact there is a day coming for every human being called judgment. Now, for the same person, each one will appear before Jesus all alone. Here's one of those meetings you can't take nobody in with you. You can't call Pookie them to come with you every day. You can't call a Johnny Cochran like to come with you at this meeting. This is where you want to be all by yourself. And you want to stand before the Lord. Now for the same person, each one of us will appear before Jesus in the judgment that's called the judgment of the just or the beam of judgment. Romans chapter 14, verse 10 through 12 is a, is a verse I would write down and go back and review. It says, for we will all stand before God's judgment seat. Look at the next phrase. Each of us will give an account of himself to God. I don't know about you, but if Jesus showed up right now and said, I need to do it. You know how it is before you get to find they go midterm. <laughs> And today was midterm day. And the Lord was coming to 
gives us specificity to the being of judgment of the judgment of the just. When it says each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he receives a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he'll suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through the fire. So in other words, what, what, what God will, it's like you're going to have a meeting with Jesus and he's going to go up on the big screen. And he's going to show you your life on the big screen. And he's going to show you that time when you called up Don Parker and you went and gave Don Parker because Don Parker was having a little trouble. And you decided to help Don Parker out and you gave him a few hundred dollars to go on a meeting. Then you turn around and go tell everybody in the church what you got to do. You got to go to the church. You know, I'm having some trouble. And, 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 Certainly not sinful things, but they mean nothing without having a relationship. 
salvation is by grace through faith. Now this faith is the type of faith that radically changes your lifestyle. Jesus becomes your Lord and your Savior. You cannot work your way into heaven. And any work apart from Jesus and the Holy Spirit anointing is dead works. That is why Jesus says in verse 23, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Church, there is but one basis for salvation. It is a mere verbal confession. It is not mere works only. But it's by placing saving faith in Jesus that results in a radically changed life. Jesus becomes your Lord and Savior. Not everyone who says the right language is in right relationship with God. The people in verse 23, whereby Jesus says, depart from me. All the people by lifestyle are practicing lawlessness and not practicing holiness. They are not saved and set apart for God. Practicing lawlessness means one thing. It means unrepentant sin. They are not struggling with a sin. They do not want, they do what they do knowingly that is sin and they suppress the truth as stated in Romans chapter 1 and verse 18. Again, we all sin, but because of the word of God and the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of the saved person, we have the means to know what is sin. How do we know it? The word of God determines it. And we'll have the power to overcome the sin. That's the Holy Spirit as we pray back the word and submit to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Attending church, working in the church, giving generously to the church, being baptized of all things we ought to do, but that does not in and of itself affirm that you're saved. Romans 8 and 6 says this. I jot this one down. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. If there's no Holy Spirit working in you, you're not saved. That is where the power comes to be able to resist the temptation. That is where the knowledge will come for us to be able to know what he wants us to do, where he wants us to go. It comes from the word of God as we pray back the word and the Holy Spirit will then lead us. We say it all the time, Lord, lead and guide me. <laughs> now, if you are saved, you will also bear fruit of the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. You will bear love and joy and peace and long-suffering and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Now, 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 you may not bear them all equally well. <laughs> Don't look at nobody who, who, who might uh, have a little, little need some more work in any one of these areas and you assume that they're not saved because we are all, if you can if you truly say you're also walking around with a big old sign over your head saying work in progress. <laughs> and, and all of us got something that, uh, that, that God is working on in us. That's the very reason why we have so many trials and tribulations is because God quite often uses those trials and tribulations because it'll draw you to him. You'll start praying and when you start praying, you'll start working on your character. You'll start showing you what's praying and Church, I plead with you to allow today and this meeting necessary to be a week for you to do some personal inspection. God desires for you to be saved. And if you say he desires for you to go share the gospel with others, cast that need. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
I close with this. Many of us have seen the movie Drumline. Actor Nick Cannon portrayed the character Devin Miles, who was a hot shot, but also an ultra talented drummer. A college requirement for entry into the band at that college in that movie stated you had to be able to read music. Yeah. Dad and I on his application. And throughout most of the movie, he was able to hide that stuff. He was so good. Good works. He was so good. He could memorize things. He was so good, but he couldn't read music. He could he did not meet the requirement. But one day, albeit he was tricked, but one day the student leader of the drum line asked the band director to allow this pop shot their mouths to show off his talents and play some brand new out of prison. Dad said, oh no, oh no, well, let my brother play that. He did so much better than me. I don't want to do that now. Exposed his lie. Exposed his flaw. Now, the great thing about this example is that because Devin was still alive and the band director had mercy on him, Devin was demoted for a season, but once Devin submitted to what was required to be in the band, he learned how to do this. He was given That you are a child of God. He will be our seal and guarantee of the redemption of our whole bodies. So are you ready to surrender your life to Christ? So I ask the question again. I know who Jesus is. Thank you. 
realize that they're not saved, that they need to surrender to you right here and right now. Father, I know you desire that none perish. So I know you're willing and able to save anybody. Have your way right now. It is in Jesus, my everlasting, my transformational name, that I pray.